Well, welcome to this theological journey that you're here beginning on, and this is the first lecture in a series of lectures. Uh, I'm assuming that you're also reading this book, uh, Millard Erickson's Introducing Christian Doctrine. It's a really helpful text. It's basic, it's central, it's clear. Uh, Millard is my friend. He's a committed churchman, a very sophisticated theologian, man of God, loves Jesus, and his book is a good guide for doing that. However, I will say it's not essential that you read it, uh, although I'll be referring to it from time to time. What I do in the lectures here will be pretty self-contained. So, let's begin. Let's think about why do theology? Uh, why invest this kind of time in studying uh, something abstruse like theology? Well, I, I had a friend here a while back and I was talking to him about what I do, uh, Gary Bershears here at Western Seminary, and he said, I don't need this theology stuff, I just love Jesus. And I said, well, like, who's Jesus? Well, everybody knows who Jesus is, he said. <laughs> I just laughed, you've got to be kidding. We've got Jesus the progressive teacher, we've got Jesus the God who looks like a man, we've got Jesus, I mean, there's all kinds of understandings of who Jesus is. And theology is understanding, like, who is God, who is Jesus, what do I do about the sin in my life, where do I hear the voice of God, and little details like that. How in the world can I reestablish this broken relationship with God? And why in the world should I get out of bed in the morning anyway? Is there any purpose to this life? And what does the, the community of God look like? I mean, these are kind of fundamental questions of life. And what theology is about is trying to answer some of those very, very fundamental questions. So I'm going to devote this first time to just talking about how I approach questions. Uh, so this is what we call theological method. The reason behind it, the other thing I should have said, you need your Bible. Because I'm an unrepentant Bible geek and we're going to be using it in every single session. So have your Bible. I've got mine here in front of me. It's on my computer. Uh, print Bibles are good. Computer Bibles are good. Any Bible is good. Which translation doesn't really make any difference. Uh, I'm going to be using the New International Version uh, much of the time. Uh, occasionally I'll do others, but you know, whichever. So take your Bible, uh, turn to Psalm 139. I mean, this one is an amazing psalm. Psalm 139, David talking. And after he's talked about uh, the character of God that we'll look back later on, uh, Psalm 139, verse 17, gives us the attitude that we bring into doing theology. And here's what he says. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. And that attitude in theology is everything. Because this is the God of the universe who not only has made us in the universe around us, but has revealed himself to us in hopes that he can have a relationship with us, a good, healthy relationship. And when I think about that, I think about my wife and how precious her thoughts are to me. How precious are your thoughts, O Lord? <laughs> but how vast! Uh, there's just unending depth to what God has revealed, and there's a lot of stuff that he hasn't revealed. We want to pursue those we have. Uh, but when it's all done, we've done all of our theology thinking, we've done all of our sorting through various options, all trying to understand what's going on, the bottom line is the end of verse 18. I am still with you. And the reality is that through the work of Jesus Christ, we have received this reconnection with God through the Holy Spirit, and we have that kind of I am with you, the most profound of all things, the foundation of everything we do, is I am with you. So that's the beginning, that's the attitude in theology, is your thoughts are super precious. Another passage I want to look at, uh, New Testament, book of Titus. So if you can turn over to that book. Uh, Titus, of course, Paul is writing to his disciple. And in that disciple book, he begins by telling Titus how to be a mature a godly person. He's writing specifically to somebody who's an elder, an overseer here, but this idea of a leader in God's congregation, I hope that's what you're looking for. You want to be a mature a man, woman of God, 
able to lead the congregation in whatever role you end up with. The people of God, I hope you're doing it where you're at right now. And as he talks about this qualification to be a leader, a mature person of God, uh, he gives some basic things, be above reproach. He's talking about elders specifically here, so husband and wife, children and believer, and so on. But I want you to come down to verse 9. In all these characters, the thing I'm thinking of here is at verse 9. Uh, this mature person must hold firm the trustworthy word is taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and rebuke those who contradict. That's my goal for these courses, is to help you be mature in your thinking so you're not subject to the kind of deception that runs around everywhere, that you can hold firm to what God has revealed, know what you hold well and what you hold lightly, and that you'll be able to refute those who contradict. And God knows there are a lot of those, always have been, still are today. So that's our goal here, is to have you just in love with the thoughts of God and to be able to stand firm in what God has revealed and to do that in such a way that you can help other people who are struggling or growing and just be a leader, a discipler uh, for the cause of, the, of Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing together. Now, how do we do this? Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of questions. Uh, you can take a question like, uh, what does it mean to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? You can take a question like, uh, oh, how many parts of a person are there? Uh, what is the heart of sin? All those kinds of things. And when you have a question that you're wrestling with, what I want you to be able to do is follow through on that question. Uh, now, Dr. Erickson, in the book here, has a series that he talks about. He talks about collection of biblical materials, which just means like read the Bible, uh, use some things like a, a cross-references or other things to just find out where the biblical materials relating to that are. The unification of the biblical materials, analysis of the meanings of the biblical, mean, biblical teachings, uh, examination. Have you got that yet? Well, it's in the book. I'll leave those for those. Let me unpack it a little bit differently than he does. I've got a question. Uh, let's just say I'm wrestling with the question, uh, how do I, what, how many parts of a person are there? I grew up with a teaching uh, in my early years of theology that there are three parts of the person, body, soul, spirit. And uh, uh, that, was, that was just a given but then I ran into somebody who said, no, that's not right. There are only two parts to a person. There's body and soul and spirit are interchangeable. And that had a lot of impact on how I was dealing with sin in my life, so it became an important question to me. So how do you deal with it? How do you deal with a question, any question? Well, the first way you can do that is pretty simple. You can just go ask your pastor. You can go ask your teacher. You can go ask your discipler. So if you look at Hebrews 13, 17, Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls. And we find this happening a lot in Scripture, where you just go to a leader and you ask them, like, help me. And that's quick and easy. Uh, if you've got a good leader who's well-trained and godly, he will give you answers. Uh, she will guide you to the right spot to do those kind of things. And you walk away and say, okay, great, I got the answer. Well, there's a couple downsides to that. First of all, if somebody else asks you a question, I can say, well, my pastor believes, my teacher taught me. But what you can't do is ask their questions that they ask of you. Well, what about? Uh, hang on a minute, I'll go talk to my teacher. Well, it, that's not the best way to do it. That's a good place to begin. I don't mean to downplay it, but it's only a beginning. The other thing is that there's are places a lot of times where there's difference of opinion among godly people. And, you know, I like my leader. I trust him. Uh, she is guiding me really well. Uh, but I realize there are other people who don't agree on that. So there's some shortcomings of that, but it's a great place to start. Uh, the next thing to do is just go to the Bible and find every passage that talks about how many parts to the person. Now, I don't know about you, but the Bible's pretty thick. 
There's a lot of passages there. Uh, the Bible is absolutely a foundation of everything we do. Absolutely everything we do is by, founded on biblical authority. There are other authorities beyond that, but the foundation is always what does the Bible say. So we always want to come back to Scripture. So now what do we do? Well, look at Acts 17.11. Uh, this is a place where Paul has been kicked out of a town, and he arrives in a little town called Berea. And when he gets to Berea, this is Acts 17, 11, he says, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, <clears throat> examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And I think this pattern gives us a picture of how to approach the question of how do we answer questions of theology. Who is Jesus? How many parts of the person? What's the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What do I do about sin in my life? And so on. <clears throat> Here we have Paul teaching. The people of Berea are receiving from him. That's why I said go to your leader and ask him or her what they believe. But then they're doing something else. They've got their Bible opening and as a group, they're examining scriptures carefully, daily, to see if what he says is true. And that's the attitude I want you to have when you're studying theology. I want you to go to trusted leaders. I want you to ask them what they believe. I want you to ask them which passages they think are important for this particular doctrine. I want you to ask them how they interpret certain controversial passages. Uh, and then I want you to have your Bible open so that you're constantly saying, how does this relate to the data of Scripture? Now, here's the trick. When you come to these people, and I think you should go to people who hold different views where that's possible. Take something like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You've got Pentecostal, you've got Charismatic, you've got uh, Continuationist, you've got people who are cessationists that think all that stuff ended. There's a, quite a variety there. So I think you should go to somebody who's a full-blown Pentecostal. <clears throat> I think you should go to somebody who's charismatic. I think you should go to somebody who's, as a term use it, open but cautious. And you should go to somebody who thinks all that stuff ended with the apostles. And you should go to those people through their writings or through live people and say, what do you believe? You should say then, what are your key passages that you appeal to? You should ask, how do you interpret certain controversial passages, 1 Corinthians 12, for example, or Acts chapter 2? Uh, and all of this, you're not evaluating. You're not evaluating. What you're doing is trying to understand. What do you believe? What do you believe about it? What are the key issues you get into? And make some notes constantly with your Bible open and saying, how does that relate? And then I go to different people and I get their input. I mean, this is the ideal way to do it. Uh, and then I see which view accounts for the most biblical data with the fewest difficulties. Now, let me say it again, because I think it's really important. You go to people who represent different views where you can, either through blog sites or articles or books or historical treatments, and you say, what do you believe? Trying to understand what they believe. Where are the key passages you appeal to? How do you understand controversial passages? All this while trying to understand what they believe and why. Uh, and then after you've collected several different views, you look at them and you say, which view accounts for the most data of scripture with the fewest difficulties? And that does a couple things. One, it helps you understand that really good and godly people can differ on some of these things. So I don't end up becoming tribal and hating everybody who disagrees with me. That's the fundamentalist attitude. I, and I can begin to sort out and understand, okay, I see how you disagree on that. I think this is the best view. I, uh, but you understand that other good and godly people can disagree on that. I think that's a great attitude to have in theology. Uh, so let me say it one more time. Uh, I'm a repeater here. Uh, go to people who hold different views where you can, firsthand. Uh, if you want to understand Pentecostalism, don't go to somebody who thinks that the gifts ceased. 
back in the days of the apostles, go to somebody who's a true Pentecostal. If you understand somebody who says the gifts cease, don't read a Pentecostal analysis of them, go to somebody who believes that. Ask them, what do you believe? What are the key passages you appeal to? How do you understand controversial passages? And then, uh, as you gather those together, then ask which one accounts for the most data with the fewest difficulties. Now, Dr. Erickson packs this a little bit further, but he's uh, very similar to what I'm doing in the method that he's espousing. Here's one more step. Uh, he talks about it as uh, uh, understanding the stratification of the topics. What in the world does that mean? Well, here's my way of saying th There are some things that are worth dying for. Uh, Somebody puts a gun to my head and says, deny it or I'll kill you, I'm going to have to say, shoot, because I'm not going to deny the deity of Jesus Christ, for example. There are other things that we divide for. Uh, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, but these differences are so central, we can't be together in the same church. We just we argue with each other too much. Or they're central to the way we do church. Uh, so we divide, for example, a Pentecostal question. That's been a classic divide for. Uh, somebody who's a full-blown Pentecostal is going to say, you need to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's subsequent to conversion. And when you have it, you're going to know it because you're going to speak in tongues and feel like you've got 200,000 volts of electricity. Somebody who's a non-Pentecostal is going to say, there's a lot of room for emotion, but we just don't do that around here. And that difference in the way you do things can be a point that you divide over. And there are a number of places like that. I think as few as possible. Uh, then there's, so die for, divide for. Uh, the third level, as I do this somewhat facetiously, is the debate for. These are things where we're in the same congregation. We work together. <clears throat> we laugh together. But when you get in these tops, we start growling at each other because we feel pretty strongly about this. So it may be something like the security of the believer. Can somebody really lose their salvation? We can be in the same fellowship, but if we get close to that, we start and uh, feel pretty strongly. Uh, so die for, divide for, debate for, and then decide for, like who cares? We don't really worry about those things. We differ and it's fine. Uh, these things can change over time. Uh, when I first came to Western here, uh, we had chapel, and in, in our days, as a more cessationist type school, if somebody raised their hands in worship, somebody would go talk to them and say, what's, what's wrong with you? Uh, in my, the Portland Bible College, the Pentecostal school across town, when they had chapel, if somebody didn't raise their hand, somebody would go talk to them and say, what's wrong with you? Is your spiritual life in good order? Now, I'm being a little bit sarcastic there, but those divides were real. And today, it's who cares? I mean, in both places, there are people who are rocking it out for Jesus, and there's some who are pretty contemplative in the way they approach worship. It's a decide for today, but it used to be more of a divide for. These things will change. So I think it's helpful to know what is it that's absolutely essential. The Bible is inspired, authoritative. God is triune. God is relational. Jesus is God incarnate. He's fully God and fully man. Uh, humans are broken in their relationship with God, they need reconciling, that sacrifice of Jesus Christ has accomplished that, his life, death, resurrection, exaltation. We come into relation to him through uh, receiving his gift of restored relationship, uh, and then we come together in spirit-led community to join in the mission of God to take the goodness of God to the world. These are die-for things. Uh, these are essential to faith, and so on down. So my goal very much is that you will approach theology with this kind of a method, looking for what we agree on, first of all, because that's unifying to us. And those things that we disagree on as evangelicals, we're looking to maintain relationship, maintain unity, maintain common mission as much as possible, and then debate vigorously these kinds of things, but debate as friends not as enemies, calling each other false teachers and heretics. Now, did you get all that? I know this is really packed. Uh, attitude in theology, love your thoughts, oh God. I want to be equipped to lead people and develop myself and others. Uh, the method in theology, it preferably,
go to people representing different views, ask them, what do you believe, why, what are your key passages, and then which view accounts for the most data with the fewest difficulties, and then hold some things tightly, and that's where everybody's going to agree, other things divide for, maybe decide, debate for, decide for, and then come to the unity of the Holy Spirit as much as possible, and those places where you disagree, do it charitably and as friends, fellow journeys in service of Jesus Christ. And at the end of the day, what we'll do is we'll find out there's a much deeper understanding of what's going on. We have better understandings of how to do things, those crucial questions like, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And there'll be a deeper love and a deeper unity that will come out of that. There you go, theological method.